Now welcome to part 8 of my story that will, in a way, both carry on the Star Wars sequel trilogy or continue the journey of some of its characters, while also sort of rewriting or undoing the story of the sequels at the same time. Or, as I like to put it, this is a story of how what comes next will change what came before. And if you're new to the story or you haven't seen the first several parts of this yet, I would highly, highly recommend starting with part 1, and if you enjoy it, you can work your way back to this one. Otherwise, what's going on in the story right now will make no sense to you whatsoever. And a link to the playlist can be found in the description below. And now, without further ado, let's get back to the story. We're back in the cargo hold of a small freighter, where Finn, Mara Jade, and Ahsoka Tano have been picked up and off the planet Malachor, just as the ruins of a Sith temple and the area all around it broke apart and threatened to swallow them up. And now we watch as the pilot of that freighter, who just entered the cargo bay and is dressed as some type of bounty hunter, removes his helmet and reveals the face of a some 60-year-old Poe Dameron, which immediately causes Finn to react by staring in disbelief, shaking his head in confusion and amazement, almost as if not trusting his eyes. And just when Finn is about to say something, after finally finding the words to do so, Poe quickly draws his blaster and points it at Mara Jade, who instantly reacts by grabbing and igniting her lightsaber, or, more accurately, the saber that once belonged to Leia, but has been brought back from the future by Finn. The words he was going to say now forever forgotten, Finn instead yells out one word, wait, though he doesn't seem to know which one he's exactly saying it to, as he holds out an open-palmed hand to both of them. Poe takes a moment to just glance at Finn before glaring back at Mara and saying, I'm guessing you're Mara Jade, the one who led the Imperials to Alzuna to try to capture the child. Mara, the expression on her face, a cold one, simply says back, If you know that much, then you also know my mission failed. The child got away. The post shakes his head. He was tracked by bounty hunters. People I cared about were killed. My wife is gone. Wife? Finn echoes, taking a careful step towards both of them, or towards the middle of both of them, hands still outstretched. He then looks at Poe and says, What What happened to you? What happened to Ray?" Poe almost looks confused by the question, shakes his head a bit and says, That was all so long ago. But Finn also shakes his head and says, Not for me. For me, I last saw you days ago. And you were... Poe shuts his eyes and quickly says, I was under her control. But then he quickly opens his eyes, shakes his head and corrects himself and says, No. I was under his control, under Palpatine's control. We both were. He was in my head the whole time. Upon hearing this, Mara lowers her saber ever so slightly, her expression not quite as cold as it was a moment ago. She then looks at Finn and asks, What is he talking about? Finn responds, We were friends once, the three of us, in the future. But then, Ray changed, and you changed too. But Poe quickly responds, I couldn't get his voice out of my head. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shut him out. Mara then lowers her saber even more, and Poe continues. Not until I followed her through the portal and we ended up apart somehow. I suddenly found myself on Coruscant of all places, and everything was chaotic. People were panicking, and there was a fire. The, the Jedi Temple, it was on fire, but it was in the past, and... Poe shakes his head as if, to this day, he still has trouble making sense of it all. He then, with Blaster still pointed at Mara, returns his focus to her and falls silent. That's when Finn takes a moment to glance at Ahsoka, who doesn't seem to be listening to any of it. In fact, she seems to be staring off at nothing, her eyes extremely distant. Finn then makes eye contact with Mara and motions subtly with his head towards Ahsoka. Mara follows his eyes and frowns a bit and makes a face that almost says, figures she'd be no help to us. And then Finn says as he starts to cautiously approach Poe, his eyes going to the blaster, Come on, let's talk about all this elsewhere if you want. Just me and you. You have my word, she's not going to cause any trouble. She's not what you might think she is. Ever so briefly, a look crosses Mara's face after Finn says that, as if those words have truly touched her on a deeper level. She then deactivates the saber, clips it back to her belt, and holds up her hands as if to say, I mean no harm, and you can shoot me if you really want to. Poe thinks it over for a moment, and ultimately lowers his blaster and motions for Finn to follow him to another part of the ship. And as they go on their way, Mara looks back at Ahsoka, lets out a sigh as if this is the last thing she wants to deal with, and she heads over to talk to her. 
That's when we're taken across the galaxy to an Imperial Star Destroyer where we're in a dimly lit detention cell where we see Rey laid out on the floor and where her eyes slowly begin to open. And when they do and when they adjust to the low light, she sits up and sees standing over her is Grand Admiral Thrawn flanked by four death troopers, two on each side, all carrying and pointed at her, something that looks like a force pike of some kind. When Rey sees him, she mutters one word in amazement, Thrawn. Upon hearing that, Thrawn's brow arches ever so slightly and he says, It seems you have me at a disadvantage, for you know my name, but I do not know yours. Rey then gets to her feet and as she does, the death troopers with their four spikes seem to tense up, as if ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. Rey glances at them, then back at Thrawn and says, I'm Rey. Thrawn gives her a look as if to say he's going to need a bit more than that, and Rey continues, I'm Rey, Rey, um... But she starts to shake her head, almost as if she's having trouble remembering. A moment later, she doubles over and winces as if in a great deal of pain, her hands going to and holding her head. All the while, Thrawn simply looks on, studying. After a few moments of this, the pain seems to subside, and Rey stands back up straight and says, I, I really, I don't remember... Thrawn gives a tight-lipped smile and says, How convenient. And did you also forget the type of weapon you were found with? Ray looks confused. Weapon? What weapon? Thrawn again gives a little smile and says, Ah, yes. I forget Jedi do not necessarily see their lightsabers as a weapon, but rather as a tool of last resort, a means by which to defend but never attack, isn't it? Ray shakes her head as if not understanding. Thrawn, his cool expression unchanged, then says, It is quite clear that you have come to this place in search of Ezra Bridger. In fact, our scans confirmed you were with him when we began our bombardment. What isn't clear, however, is what became of him, or how exactly you managed to survive such an attack relatively unscathed. Thrawn looks her over, and we now can see that she does have a few cuts and bruises on her, but nothing severe. Unless, of course... He pulled you into that place, that world between the worlds. Upon saying that we can see on his ever calm face, there is something in Thrawn's eyes, a trace of something that is a blend of anger, but also something else, something that may even be a type of borderline madness. Nevertheless, Rey only shakes her head, and with an almost pleading expression on her face, she says, I don't, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Thrawn then glances at one of the death troopers, makes a slight motion with his head, and it steps forward and jabs Ray in the side with the force pike, and we hear a sound almost like electricity flowing, though it's hard to hear that over the sudden painful screams of Ray. This lasts several long seconds until Thrawn raises a hand and the death trooper falls back. Thrawn then says, I am not normally a fan of such crude methods of gathering information, but you leave me little choice. Ray then says as wisps of steam rise up off her skin, Please, I, I don't know what you're even talking about. I don't know. Thrawn again makes a motion of the head, and the death trooper steps forward once more and sticks her again. Ray screams out in pain, but this time, after only a few moments, she stops and her face darkens as her eyes begin to glow yellow. She then extends a hand out in the direction of Thrawn, and from her fingertips, blue lightning streaks forth and passes right through Thrawn. The other three death troopers then all move forward and jab their pikes into Rey, and the darkness upon her face and yellow eyes fade as she screams out in absolute agony, and in no time, she collapses to the ground either unconscious, or maybe even dead. Meanwhile, in another room, a small room, and watching on a monitor, stands Thrawn, the real Thrawn, and he pushes a button on a control panel by the monitor, causing his holographic image in the detention cell to flicker and fade away as the death troopers make for the cell's exit. Standing next to him is a young officer, and she looks up at Thrawn with amazement on her face and says, How, Admiral? How did you know? But all Thrawn does back is give her a smile. We're back across the galaxy again. In the freighter where Poe and Finn are now off in a different part of it, talking together, and we hear Poe say, It was so strange being on Coruscant just as the Clone Wars were ending. The craziness and confusion of it all. People were celebrating the formation of the Empire and the end of the Jedi. It was so strange. It's like, I don't know, 
The whole thing snapped me back into reality somehow, and that's when I ran into her, literally right into her. Finn then chimes in and says, y Your wife, you're talking about your wife. Poe gives a nod of the head and says, She had a child with her, one that clearly wasn't her own, and she needed, well, she needed a pilot. She'd never learned how to fly herself, had always relied on a partner of some kind till he left her over this job, this job to watch the child for the Jedi. It was like I was in the exact right place at the exact right time. Finn can't help but smile as he says, that all sounds familiar somehow, especially the needing a pilot part. Poe returns the smile and puts a hand on Finn's shoulder as he says, seems I meet all the best people that way, and I'm sorry about turning on you like I did. I've been regretting it ever since, all this time. But Finn quickly says, hey, don't worry about it. I know it was Palpatine. Besides, it's all in the past now, or... Actually, the future, I think. Poe chuckles, gives him a look as if to say he understands the confusion, then continues his story. Anyway, before I knew it, she and I were working together. I was happy and back to my old ways again, like return to an old, missed lifestyle. Finn then says, Ah yes, your life as a spice runner, which you never, for some reason, bothered to mention to all of us. Poe responds back, Yeah, well, it wasn't something I was all too proud of. But I am proud of what I've been doing with my life here in the past, though I hardly look at it that way anymore. As the past, I mean. It's just my life now. What it became. Finn gives him a look over, gives the bounty hunter suit a look over, and says, Which is what exactly? Poe responds, To be honest, it was a little bit of everything in order to survive while under the iron fist of the Empire. And through it all, we kept the child safe, always finding a good hiding spot and caretakers for him. Until recently, that is. Mainly because what's left of the Empire has been nothing but focused on finding him. Finn then gives a little shrug and asks, Why not go to the New Republic for help? Or take him directly to Luke Skywalker? You know, the Jedi? Poe shakes his head and says, Because of what happens to Luke and his students, to his order in the future, we just felt like we couldn't risk it. Finn then counters, Then why not tell Luke about that? Warn him about Kylo Ren, the return of Palpatine, all of that. And as Finn is saying it, there's a look in his eyes that seems to say he thinks that's a pretty good idea, not just for Poe back then, but for him now. Poe then responds, but what if we did that? What if that's what happened the first time around? We told Luke everything, and he, well, you heard Ray's story. You heard what he almost did to his nephew. Poe falls silent a moment and then says, what if that all happens because we told Luke to be worried about him? Finn opens his mouth like he wants to instantly counter, but hesitates, looking as if Poe has just brought up a pretty good point. Finally, though, he says, I think it has to be worth the risk. I think going to Luke is the right thing to do. But Poe shakes his head and says, Doesn't really matter anymore. Some Mandalorian bounty hunter has him now, though thankfully my contact within the guild says he didn't turn him over to the Empire. Poe gives a faint smile and shakes his head and continues, That little guy probably got to him, just like he gets to everybody he comes across. But Finn then says, It does still matter. Luke still needs to know the truth. Everything that's going to happen, he needs to know. I think it can all be changed. I think this has all been carefully planned out by Ezra somehow. Besides, maybe Luke could even help us find the child. Soon enough then we're back in the cargo hold of the freighter where Mara is seated on the floor with her back to some crates looking like she could fall asleep then and there after all she's recently been through. That's when Finn enters, spots her and asks after briefly glancing around, where's Ahsoka? Mara responds, she's resting, I think she's even more exhausted than I am, if that's possible. Finn then hesitantly asks as he takes a seat on the floor next to her, is she okay otherwise? Mar gives a one-shouldered and rather skeptical shrug. Not entirely sure. Whatever happened to her down there is still affecting her. Though, I think she's rid of it for the most part. Mar gives a sad sort of smile and finishes. Unfortunately, a part of the darkness will always be with her. That's just how it works. Finn then turns his head and looks at her, a rather sympathetic look on her face. Mar then quickly snaps back. Don't do that. Don't give me that look. Don't pity me or whatever it is you're doing. That sort of thing only makes me want to end our friendship with a lightsaber. Finnegan looks straight ahead, a grin on his face as he says, So, it is a friendship. Mara lets out a sigh, rolls her eyes a bit, and then says, Speaking of friends, what's the deal with the one who was going to shoot me before? 
Finn quickly responds, I trust him completely, if that's what you're asking. And I promise you, he won't shoot you, if that's also what you're asking. Mara looks less than convinced and says, I don't know that Ahsoka is the answer you were looking for. All she kept saying was she has to keep some sort of promise, and that she has to find someone named Sabine Wren. Finn thinks a moment, and then says, Can't say I've ever heard that name before. Did she say anything else? Mara shakes her head, but then says, Something about what Anakin told her to do, that she's supposed to help you, but that she has to keep this other promise first. Great, Finn says back, a frown on his face. The two are then silent for a few moments before Mara says, So, what's our next move then? Finn then gives her a look and says, Our next move? I thought you were done with me once we found Ahsoka. Mara quickly responds, Don't give me that look either. I'm not changing my mind about training you. I'm far from the right one for that job. But I, too, still have a promise to keep, to help you after you saved my life. Mara lets out a bit of a sigh and continues, Besides, it's not like I have anything better to do right now. Finn again looks at her. I thought you said something before about serving your own purpose or something. You telling me you're not so sure what that's supposed to be anymore? Mara again gives Finn a look, takes hold of her lightsaber and shows it to him before saying, You really do want me to end our friendship, don't you? Finn, only slightly worried that she's serious, raises his hands in a surrendering fashion. Hey, kill me and you won't get to hear my crazy idea. Mara shakes her head like she doesn't want to hear it anyway, but then tells him to go ahead. Finn says, What if we try to find Luke Skywalker? When Finn gets nothing but silence, he turns to look at her and says, And yeah, I know what you said before, that your last command or something was to kill him, but I'm kind of hoping maybe you could be persuaded not to do that. Without a word, Mara then hops to her feet and begins to walk away, saber still in hand as she heads over to a window in the cargo hold that looks out into deep space. She then says, Perhaps I could be persuaded to at least listen to what he has to say. Finn then says good as he smiles and shuts his eyes and leans his head back against a crate and falls asleep almost instantly. That's when we're once again taken across the galaxy to an underground cavern full of life and light on an otherwise strange, barren world where Ezra Bridger sits alone staring out at the crystal blue waters of a small lake that a herd of strange deer-like animals drink from. Suddenly then Ezra says, so, you want me to be the keeper of this place. Is that it? Is that why you keep calling me Keeper? The voice of Revan then comes from behind him and simply says, It is indeed. Ezra then turns his head and now sees the body of Light Side Revan standing behind him. You couldn't ask me this a long, long time ago before I spent all that time on the surface? Revan says nothing to that, and so Ezra continues. Why me? And what am I even supposed to do here? As far as I can tell, you seem to be doing a good enough job as Keeper. But Revan shakes his head and says, I am no more than an echo, a part of everything else here, given shape to answer your questions, to help you understand. Ezra quickly says back, And so I'd what, just stay here forever, sitting around doing this? Revan answers, You would be here until the darkness is defeated, the dark side echo in the living force, no more. And then, all of this fades away too. Ezra gets to his feet, turns to face Revan, and says, And what happens to Rey? What about her? The light side Revan simply says, The darkness has claimed her, I'm afraid. Which means, what exactly? Ezra snaps back. We just let her die? She doesn't deserve that. She deserves a chance. Revan then counters, So much concern for one you do not even know. Again, Ezra snaps back. Isn't that what being a Jedi is? Compassion for everyone? That's what my master taught me anyway. So how can the light side be okay with what's happening to her, to one that served it, that was chosen by it? Revan answers. As a Jedi, she understands the sacrifices that must be made. Besides, freeing her of the darkness would only hasten its pursuit of the one it truly desires, if it does not already seek him in earnest. That's when we're taken somewhere else in the galaxy, where we see a dark-haired child, maybe around the age of four or five, seated in the pilot seat of an old Karelian freighter we recognize to be the Millennium Falcon. And though the ship is docked somewhere, that isn't stopping the boy from flipping switches and making sounds as if it were in flight, 
and in a firefight of some kind, no less. While seated next to him the whole time, making sure he doesn't flip the wrong switch, is the boy's father, Han Solo. Elsewhere in the ship, then, we see Luke Skywalker standing with his twin sister, Leia, both smiling as they overhear the noises of battle coming from the cockpit. Luke then says to her, He's going to make a fine pilot one day. A better one than even his father, I think. Leia says back, Do I sense a note of disappointment in your voice? Luke gives a little shake of the head, then says, giving an almost playful look to Leia, I was told to pass on what I had learned, but so far the only student I've had decided to give up her training. Leia quickly shakes her head. I'm sorry, Luke. It's just that... But Luke cuts her off and quickly says, It's okay, Leia. I understand. I do. You love Han, your life, and your son. And sometimes... I even wish... But Luke falls silent, and so Leia takes a step forward, takes her brother's hand, and says, You wish what, Luke? To that, Luke says, It's nothing, really. Luke then carefully pulls his hand free and turns from her. Leia then seems to focus, as if trying to sense something, and after a few moments of that, she says, You're still feeling it, aren't you? This darkness that's out there. Luke then turns back around and says, The Sith are gone. There should be balance. And for a while, it felt like there was. But now there's something else, something that I feel draws ever closer with each passing day. And I'm the only Jedi to stand against whatever it is. Leia's face becomes grave, and she says, her voice quieting as if she doesn't want anyone to overhear, If you think it's that important, Luke, I'll come back. I'll take up my training again. Luke smiles gently at her and says, I know you would, but I didn't mean to imply that at all. It's just that every day I listen for something. Every day I wait for some type of sign or feeling from the Force. And every day all I feel is this rising darkness creeping ever closer. Leia then asks, And what do your uh, old friends have to say about it? Luke shakes his head. I haven't seen them since Endor. They told me then that it may be some time before I did see them again, that it all depends on the flow of the Force. But now I fear I'm not hearing them because... Luke shakes his head as if it's difficult to explain, but then he continues, I fear maybe their voices are being drowned out by the darkness. I fear that... I don't know what to do, Leia. The two then quickly embrace, and Leia says again, I'll come back if you want me to. Han will understand. But Luke shakes his head, no... There's got to be another way. Someone else I'm meant to find, perhaps. Leia pulls back from Luke, and in her hand now is a lightsaber, her lightsaber, the one she constructed and used during her brief training. Leia then says, I've been meaning to give this back to you. Maybe when you find that student, you could let them use it. Luke takes the saber, looks it over for a moment, and then hands it back to Leia. And as she takes it again, Luke says, Keep it, and keep your eyes open, and your feelings stretched out. I taught you much. Your ability to sense things through the Force is strong. It even saved my life once back on Cloud City. If you find someone, give them the saber. Send them to me. With your luck, maybe it's someone I'm meant to find. Maybe it'll be a sign. We then focus in on the saber in Leia's hand, which is when everything else around it changes, and we now see the same lightsaber in the hand of another, in the hand of Mara Jade, as she stands aboard a small freighter, looking out a window and into deep space, and seemingly looking for her true destiny and purpose as well. And that is where this part ends. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to tell me what you thought of this part of the story and what you think will happen next. So leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.